My name is Amber Duke. I'm the Washington editor of Spectator. I'll be moderating today's debate. Before we get started, you need to read a word about the Steamboat Institute. You're on the Steamboat Institute from of America's Board of Principles, and it's by our committee, the Active Leaders Division. They host quite a few of these gathering would be for the base. You can check out any of the past meetings on the Steamboat Institute YouTube channel. Um, I'd also like to give a special thanks to some of the Steamboat Institute. Sponsors, including the Henry Bradley Foundation, the Eagle Sports Foundation, the Diana Dave Spencer Foundation, and the Jack Brown Sherman Foundation. Our two debaters today are both quite esteemed gentlemen. I know it's such a treat for us to be able to hear them spar with one another. Uh, Professor Jonathan Turley is the J.P. of Marine C. Shapiro, excuse me, the Marine C. Shapiro Professor of Public Interest Law at the George Washington University Law School. And Randall Kennedy is the Michael Park Climate Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. So the hometown hero is his <laughs> The debate proposition today Harvard supports free speech and intellectual diversity. Professor Kennedy will be arguing the affirmative. Professor Turley will be arguing the negative. Now, before we actually get into opening remarks, you all should receive one of these QR codes. You can use this for the pre debate poll so that we can get a sense of where the crowd is standing before and after the debate to see if anyone's minds are changed. So we can take a moment to respond to the poll and we read the resolution for the screen. Again, the resolution in Harvard supports free speech. And intellectual diversity. And we're going to put those results up on the screen, live poll, so we can see generally with the colors. So, far, looks pretty 50 50. There's also an undecided option if you're not sure about it. Okay, so. A few more agree than disagree, and then we get to sign in. So that's great. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and get into this debate. And Professor Kennedy, since you are arguing the affirmative, you will get to go first. Your opening statement will be five minutes. Thank you very much. So, Harvard supports free speech and intellectual diversity. Yes, yes. Um, Harvard University is one of the great universities, not only in this country but indeed the world. And it could not be a great university if it did not support free speech and if it did not facilitate intellectual diversity. Now first about free speech. There have been a couple of occasions over the past decades in which um, the, the question of free speech has been a real a burning issue on this campus. And I'm gonna mention two episodes in which presidents of this university were forced to make hard decisions. First, 1991. In 1991, there was a controversy here at Harvard. A student put a Confederate flag in her window, in her dorm. And this caused a big ruckus, and there were demands that the university take down this Confederate flag. Lots of discussion about this. The president of the university then, Derek Bach, longtime member of the Harvard Law School faculty, wrote an article in uh, the Boston Globe in which he took on this issue. And he, he, he said that he disagreed with what the uh, student had done. He thought that this showed a, uh, a lack of decent regard for the feelings of others. But then he said in his, uh, in his article, to disapprove of a particular form of communication, however, is not enough to justify prohibiting it. And then he went on to say that um, you know, if we begin to forbid flags, it is only a short step to prohibiting offensive speakers. I suspect that no community will become humane and caring by restricting what its members can say. The worst offenders will not will simply find other ways to irritate and insult. He then he ended his piece by talking about how it was imperative for leaders of the institution, administrators, faculty, 
to seek to persuade. That was the that was what he focused on. Not prohibiting, educating, and persuading. That was 1991. And in that controversy, in that controversy, he uh, took it upon himself and the higher ups in the university gov in university governance to impose upon Harvard University a private institution, uh, uh, a First Amendment. It, it, he, he imposed upon the university um, a, um, uh, an arrangement in which the university would impose upon itself First Amendment requirements. Let me go to my second uh, episode. Last year, last year, the president of the university, Claudine Gay, before Congress, in the glare, in the glare, harsh publicity, was asked whether it would be against university policy, whether somebody could make themselves uh, susceptible to punishment if they said certain things, if they said things which were deemed to be anti-Semitic, uh, um, and at a uh, congressional hearing, this was put to her, and she said, it all depends. And she was pilloried for saying that. She was pilloried and ultimately lost her job. Now, she stuck up on that occasion. She stood for freedom of expression under very difficult circumstances. She stood for freedom of expression, was pilloried, even though what she said was correct, I'm, I'm thinking now, especially of my uh, colleague of blessed memory, Charles Freed. Charles Freed at the time said, well, if Harvard University is conducting itself according to the First Amendment, which he said was absolutely correct, but she was pilloried. Now, she too, on that occasion, stood up for uh, uh, freedom of expression, and that is what characteristically happens at Harvard University. Does Harvard University fall down? Yes, it does fall down. Sometimes it flops terribly. Let me give you two examples in the post-World War II era. The, the two examples that immediately come to my mind would be the 1950s, in which Harvard University capitulated to McCarthyism and actually uh, punished, punished uh, uh, members of the faculty here. I'm sorry. Um, uh, and, the, and the other would be in the 1980s when Harvard University, particularly this faculty, this faculty, put the kibosh on critical legal studies. So it's true that, you know, Harvard University is by no means perfect. Sometimes it flops. But what's the characteristic stance toward freedom of expression? and intellectual pluralism. Characteristically, Harvard University facilitates both of those deeply important values. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kennedy. And we'll add a, a little bit of time to your opening remarks if you'd like to take it, just so that we are being fair. Professor Charlie, take it away. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank Professor Kennedy for joining me today and for yourself as, as the moderator and for the sponsors for Harvard Law School. I should, for full disclosure, uh, say that while I do not believe that Harvard has what I would view as full free speech, it does have my son, Aiden, who is a first year student here, uh, who I'm told will be released unharmed once this is over. But I, uh, the, um, uh, in, in truth, I, I do recall him saying when he accepted that he felt that he had no alternative and he could not say no. And I just assume that was a, another example of self-censorship here at Harvard. I, but 
uh, I obviously disagree with my esteemed colleague who makes, a, as usual, a, a strong case for his institution. You know, Woody Allen said that uh, the talent of being happy is liking what you have instead of what you have not. What you don't have at this institution, despite I, the, the poll that was just taken, in my view, is free speech. In fact, if that's the measure of happiness, many in this university must be perfectly ecstatic. Uh, the fact is that out of 251 schools, Harvard this year ranked dead last in free speech on the FIRE survey. I'm about to give you some statistics that are not entirely from that survey. They come from different sources, including the Harvard Crimson. It was dead last, and the atmosphere, the environment at the school was described as abysmal. Now, obviously, if you are on the left of the political spectrum, it's not abysmal. It feels just right. And so to, one of the tests of free speech is to try to understand how others feel who may not hold your views. Let's talk about a few of the ways that we measure free speech. In, in 2022, the Harvard Crimson did a survey that found that virtually every Republican had been eliminated from the faculty at most departments, although it did say that was not a problem. In 2023, multiple departments were reviewed by the Crimson and found out three-fourths of the faculty identified as liberal or very liberal, only 2.5% identified as conservative, and only 0.4% identified as very conservative. Now, just to give you a point of comparison, the Gallup polls uh, show that this country is about equally divided among conservatives and moderates, with 36% of the populace saying they're conservative, 35 saying that they are moderate, only about 25% saying that they are liberal. So the Harvard faculty has three times that number. So less than 3% of Harvard identify as conservative, where 35% nationally of the public does. Of those people donating over $200 to political uh, parties, a breathtaking 91% of Harvard faculty's donations go to the Democrats. Even on a national average where that is a very heavily weighted in favor of Democrats, Harvard's off the charts. It doesn't happen randomly. It takes a concerted culture for a faculty to replicate their own views. And of course, those faculty members feel they have total freedom because they do. Of course, courts look at that and see de facto discrimination. If you had reduced your faculty to less than 3% women or minorities, courts would say, you know, we're not going to buy this idea that it's purely accidental. Let's take a look at your student body. A recent poll showed that overall, about 7% of Harvard students identified as conservative. The level of self-censorship at Harvard has doubled since 2021, according to survey. 28% of your students say that they regularly self-censor. Maybe not you, but your colleagues. When it comes to social media, 81% say that at Harvard they are they self-censor, 62% say they do that in public areas. It's an overwhelmingly liberal faculty, overwhelmingly liberal student body. When this was raised with one of your law professors not that long ago, he admitted, yeah, it's overwhelmingly liberal on both sides, but if you're conservative, you could always go to Pepperdine. So it's not too surprising with statements like that, that 35% of your student body feels they cannot speak freely in class. Let's look at the culture. Only 12% of Harvard students say that they believe that the administration at Harvard uh, will support free speech. The administration at Harvard comes in at 250 out of 251 in terms of its support for free speech. Studies of sanctions and deplatformings show 61% of the time they were successful at Harvard. Recently, and this is this year, uh, dean Bobo, who is the dean of your social science department, warned that free speech is not a blank check and that criticizing Harvard or its faculty could result in sanctionable violations. Now, this is not to say that I expect a, a university not to be liberal. I've taught for 30 years. I come from a liberal democratic family. I benefited from that for much of my career. 
but it is not conducive for an education. I remember one time a former president at BU said that the Charles River is the only waterway in America that has two left banks. Well, that's reality, that's fine. But I will tell you this, as someone who writes a lot about John Stuart Mill, I'll just remind you, when he said that he who knows only his side of the case knows little of that, you are not getting both sides of the case. Yes, your faculty can resuscitate uh, some of the conservative perspectives, but you're not getting that. Half of this country has views that are not represented on your faculty or in your student body. Half of the members of the court, half the judges in this country hold views that are not represented on your faculty. That's not conducive for higher education. That's not good for living a fully intellectual life. And so I will say this, that I have great respect for Harvard. I have tremendous respect for Professor Kennedy. But you can be better. But it's sort of like that old joke of how many psychiatrists does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is one, but the bulb has to want to change. Well, you have to want to change. And you have to want to change even though most of you benefit from an environment that is an echo chamber. Thank you both so much for your opening statements. I want to remind the crowd that also in your QR code, in addition to the beginning of the event, you can also submit your questions, which I will receive on this iPod that is currently sitting sadly on the floor. Um, <laughs> those uh, audience led questions towards the end of the debate. So please submit those uh, Make sure I'm going to do my best. I want to start with my first question. To Professor Kennedy, um, Professor Turley brought up the FIRE survey, mm -hmm. Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, that Harvard has been ranked dead last twice, yeah, twice in a row, past two years, 2023 and 2024. Do you think that this is a fair scorecard, and did Harvard deserve that ranking? Uh, no. I respect uh, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, um, but I think that this is actually a low point in its record. I think it's a publicity stunt. What they're trying to do is to surf off of the, you know, the, the reputation of Harvard University. Um, compared to what? I'm in higher education. I would like to know, uh, you know compared to what? Are we truly to believe that uh, the, the intellectual atmosphere of Harvard University is beneath uh, peer institutions in the United States. No, I don't take that seriously at all. Uh, before coming over here, by the way, I took a look, because I knew this would come up. I, took a, I went to the website. Uh, what happens is FIRE mentions a couple of episodes uh, in which, so for instance, they mention an episode in which uh, somebody was disinvited. There was some speaker in the English department, disinvited, and then Fire says, this is Harvard University. Harvard University is a big place. T thousands of students, thousands of faculty spread all over the place. Are there going to be things that happen? Yes. Are there going to be things that happen that are bad? Yes. This attribution that this is representative of Harvard University is, you know, uh, a mistaken view. And so, no, I don't take that. I don't take that part of uh, fire seriously at all. No. Professor Shirley, would you like to respond? I would. I mean, first of all, in response uh, to Randall's question of what you compare it to, I would say 250 other universities uh, who are subject to the same survey. This is not the first year Harvard's been ranked low. Harvard's been ranked low for many years. It's either at the bottom or at the absolute bottom of free speech. And no, uh, it is not just making this up. In fact, there was one professor at Challenge Fire. They published a detailed response to how they conducted this survey that I think is pretty conclusive. I'm not too sure if this is the incident that Randall was speaking of, but I think it might have been a reference to Devin Buckley who is an expert in British Romanticism. And she was supposed to speak here. And uh, she was all ready to go to speak about the subject of which she is world famous. And someone found out that she 
has views on transgender uh, policies uh, that they didn't like. And that was the reason she was canceled, and the university did not support her. Now, that's a good example of why Harvard justly deserves the ranking that it has. This was a leading intellectual who wanted to speak about the subject upon which she is famous. And she was denied that chance at Harvard because she holds different political views, social views from some people on this campus. That's the test of free speech. That's when you, see free speech is really easy to admire at a distance. It's easy to admire as an abstraction. The test for free speech is when you support it in favor of someone that you disagree with, even vehemently so. And you flunk that test in that circumstance. Let's dig into that a little bit more because Professor Kennedy, I understand you've written an op-ed for the Crimson arguing that disinviting speakers is not necessarily a violation of free speech mm -hmm. because sometimes those speakers deserve to be disinvited. Uh, could you expound on that a little bit more? Sure. Um, a disinvitation is itself a form of expression. So imagine if you had a theater school, let's, let's suppose you have a, you know, a, uh, a school that, uh, a film school that disinvites Harvey Weinstein. Would one say that that is, you know, an improper, you know, an, an, an improper thing to do? You might agree, you might disagree, but this idea that disinvitation, just suppose the people doing the inviting have operated in a corrupt way or in a way that you think is appalling. Somebody, you know, the, the higher ups here make an invitation to someone and I say, well, I'm a member of this community. Uh, I don't like that. I think I, I want you to disinvite this person. As far as I'm concerned, that's a political issue. You know, maybe, maybe I win, maybe I lose, but as a matter of principle, I don't see why it is that the mere making of an invitation should stop discussion. One more thing, because we, we are in a part of Harvard University, and on the matter of freedom of discussion or on the matter of orthodoxy, on the matter of pluralism, I would put the faculty of Harvard Law School before, let's talk about the faculty of Harvard Law School, since we're at Harvard Law School. So the former dean of Harvard Law School, now the provost of the university, wonderful dean, wonderful academic, John Manning, became the dean after Martha Minow, very different political persuasion. Uh, John Manning, whom I salute, um, Scalia clerk, Bork clerk, uh, very esteemed member of this faculty. Uh, take a look at this faculty. This is part of Harvard University, and this is part of why I would say that if we're talking about Harvard University, uh, intellectual diversity is in fact facilitated. We, there, is, there is no university law school in the United States that has the range, that has the complexity, that has the density of this law school's faculty, and that should be preserved, and we, that we should not allow that to be vilified by overblown uh, criticisms of the sort that are all too, um, all too present in uh, our present political discourse. I, I disagree. I, the, um, first of all, the example of what would happen if you have Weinstein is asked to, uh, to speak here. You didn't have to do that. You don't have to get there. You had. Uh, Professor Sullivan, who was the dean, uh, who was the head of one of your houses, who had the audacity of representing Weinstein. Mm -hmm. And people demanded, because of that, they be stripped of that position. Uh, there were law professors that supported him in a letter that I admire, uh, but the, the university did not support him particularly well. 
Uh, he was stripped of that position. That would have been an easy thing, it would seem to me, for the university to say, you know what? We don't get rid of people because they represent unpopular persons. I'm a criminal defense attorney by training. If that was the standard, uh, I can promise you I wouldn't be hired anywhere. But here was the moment of truth again. And while, yes, you can point to people who've been made dean, uh, but the range at the Harvard faculty, I must say, I don't see that range in what Professor Kennedy made his remark on. But I want to address something much more general, this idea that disinviting is an act of free speech. Now, it's true. I've been called a free speech absolutist. I, um, I'm really not, although that used to be a compliment. I, but the... The fact is, this comes up a lot in debates, as academics say, well, deplatforming, shouting down uh, speakers, uh, the heckler's veto, the disinviting, uh, are all forms of free speech. They're not. I talk about that in my book, The Indispensable Right, uh, at length, because it is an incredibly obnoxious argument. This idea that, and I've had students do that, I had a debate with John Yu. Uh, over the torture memos. I've been very, I was very critical of John. But during that debate, people stood up and shouted John down repeatedly. And afterwards, they came up to me and said, you know, Professor, we want you to know, it wasn't, we weren't opposed to you. We support you. And I said, what makes you think? What, what makes you possibly think that I believe that you were doing a good thing? What you were doing wasn't free speech. You were stopping people from hearing opposing views. That's not free speech. It's conduct. So in many deplatformings, in many of these heckler vetoes, yeah, I think students should be suspended for interrupting speakers and events. Now, in terms of disinviting, which is different, and I don't mean to paint uh, Professor Kennedy with that same brush. And I, Thank you. And, and I respect Professor Kennedy's views on free speech. But yes, uh, disinviting people because you disagree with their views, people like Professor Buckley, is anti-free speech conduct, is part of the anti-free speech movement. And documented among FIRE are many of these incidences of cancel campaigns that have succeeded at Harvard. And no, I don't expect that many people at Harvard feel that bite. I don't feel like many of them feel that they lost anything because they don't agree with those speakers. But is that the test? That think about just for a second, how many truly controversial speakers from the right you've heard from at, uh, at Harvard University? Because the statistics aren't good. So we can, we can exchange anecdotal examples, but there's a reason why Harvard, year in and year out, is ranked at the bottom of free speech lists. Would you like to go ahead? Sure. I saw you taking notes, so feel free to respond. Well, I mean, the I'm glad that you uh, made it clear that I was not, or I, I want to make it clear, I was not saying that shouting down someone is acceptable. It's not. I was not giving justification to a heckler's veto. I was saying, however, that for someone to simply express disapproval of an invitation, and then to turn to the community and say, that was a mistake. I want you to join me in urging the people that issued the invitation to change their minds. Why, as a matter of principle, is that wrong? That is simply, that is simply somebody expressing a political point of view and urging colleagues to join them. Why isn't that just straight out politics? I would love to answer that. Uh, that what's wrong with that is no one's questioning that opposing a speaker's free speech. I'm all in favor of that. I'm all in favor of protesting. I love protests. I, I defend protesters that I don't even agree with because that is the ultimate form of free speech. There's a difference between saying, let's protest the speaker and let's try to cancel the speaker. The second issue is something that denies free speech for people being here to be allowed to hear opposing views. And yes, it, it demands a lot of you. It means that what I'm asking for you to do is something that is really hard, right? It's, it's being outside and protesting someone while supporting their right to speak. That's not easy. 
The problem is what I hear in Professor Kennedy's defense of that is what I hear a lot in Harvard, that Harvard constantly follows Oscar Wilde's principle, that the only way to be rid of temptation is to yield to it. And so, yeah, you don't like speakers? Let's organize and not have others hear those views. That's the Rubicon that you have crossed too many times, and that's why this university is ranked so lowly. Professor Kennedy, I'll give you the brief last word, and then we'll move to a different topic. Sure. Um, one of the things that I think, one, one of the reasons why I was interested in participating in this debate is because our Harvard University, and actually across higher education, but particularly Harvard, has been the target of a very powerful, a very well-organized campaign of vilification. Uh, the, the, most, the most striking manifestation of it is with this committee uh, headed by Congresswoman Virginia Fox that is attempting to intimidate and harass this university and others. It poses a danger to higher education. And I think that people who are friends of higher education across the ideological spectrum should recognize that and should rally and, 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 and not, not give in to this campaign of vilification. The next place I'm going is related to this um, in regards to Harvard's handling of the pro-Palestine encampments that took place over the past year in response to Israel's war in Gaza. Uh, you said in your opening remarks that President Claudine Gay, former President Claudine Gay, had responded the right way by saying that whether or not calling for genocide of Jews or other perceived anti-Semitic statements would be a violation of university policy depends on the context. If she was pushed out of her job at Harvard because of that, would that suggest that Harvard's not sufficiently committed to free speech if you think that she did the right thing? Um, first of all, just as a, as a factual matter, the question that was posed to her was, had to do with a chant and so the inference that was made was that this was genocidal. She was never actually asked, you know, what would she say? But Thank frankly, you for the clarification. Okay, but I mean, frankly, even if she was asked the question about genocide, her response would have still been the correct one. As for Harvard, how Harvard has responded, I said in my opening remarks that actually, you know, I'm not up here to say, to defend uh, Harvard University in every respect. I think that Harvard University, and in fact, I think that, uh, you know, former President Gay, actually, one of the things I'm critical, of, I'm critical of her, uh, after having actually said the correct thing, she then apologized on any number of occasions. There was a lot of political pressure, she apparently thought that one way of maybe evading this political pressure was to apologize. She ought not to have apologized. She should have stood her ground because what she said was, in my view, uh, completely unobjectionable. Uh, the way that Harvard University dealt with that, it seems to me, um, and, and the way it's dealing with things now, it's quite clear that Harvard's feeling pressure from big donors, it's feeling pressure from the Congress. Uh, it is, you know, retreating in various ways. Um, that, it seems to me, is, 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 is worrisome. So I'm not gonna say that Harvard University is correct in everything it does. I will still say, however, that characteristically, characteristically, this university takes its mission seriously. It's willing to think and rethink uh, its positions. And to that extent, uh, I think as an institution, 
uh, it does facilitate the values that we uh, associate with great universities. Yes, and if I may pose a question to you uh, in response as well, do you think that when Claudine Gay was testifying in front of Congress that she was sort of engaging in a form of free speech absolutism? Yeah, let me get to that. I just want to address one thing uh, that was said, and that is I would have thought, I, I don't know this committee that you're referring to, I, I, I can imagine uh, what it involves, but I would have thought since you had just defended uh, disinviting people as an act of free speech that you'd welcome that committee. Uh, but I don't like uh, a lot of pressure on higher education in the form of trying to target uh, individuals. I've opposed efforts to ban books and other things uh, to try to prohibit certain ideas. But I will note that this idea that Harvard is a victim uh, of a vilification campaign is a little hard to accept. You have virtually cleansed your faculty of Republicans and conservatives. These are self-surveys. These are people who are identifying themselves, okay? Uh, you have virtually cleansed out most of the conservatives in the student body. Not all, you still have some conservatives uh, among your student body, but you have a very low percentage. That doesn't just happen, right? It doesn't just happen that you have this effective ideological echo chamber uh, at Harvard. So I'm afraid I don't really sort of, I'm not exactly won over that you are some hit and run victim uh, of uh, a vilification campaign. Now in terms of the Palestinian a protest. I've supported, I opposed the banning of uh, Palestinian groups on campuses. Uh, I think that the presidents of those universities made a serious mistake when they went to law firms to prep for that hearing and they gave an overly lawyered answer, which failed dramatically. It's one of the things I've told uh, people in the past when they, I've testified over a hundred times in Congress. When people ask me, I say, for the love of God, don't go to lawyers for your testimony. Uh, that because uh, people can pick up that you're inauthentic and oftentimes you don't listen to the question. Now, I, when it comes to this business of between the river and the sea, it is a very difficult question because there happens to be a country there. And uh, saying that uh, you're going to liberate between the river and the sea uh, is taken by many Jewish students as saying that uh, their existence in that space is being questioned. I understand President Gates' difficulty in trying to mine that line. I have said, however, that groups can be disciplined for conduct. One of the things I talk about in my book is that we have to stop regulating speech. We have to stop punishing people for the content of their speech. But you can punish people for conduct. Deplatforming is conduct. Occupying the Hamilton Building at Columbia and trashing it is conduct. And those things you can be punished for. Harassing individual students is conduct. T tearing down the pictures of, of uh, Jewish hostages is conduct. It's also something uh, that runs against the very purpose of higher education to try to stop people from seeing or hearing opposing views. So yes, you can be punished as part of this. I expect that uh, Professor Kennedy and I will agree in a lot of respects with regard to the protection of free speech in that regard. First, I agree with much of what you said. There's one issue, though, that I, I'd like to come back to. You criticize Harvard University, and in your criticism, you talked about how different the faculty of Harvard University looks like as a comp you know compared to America. Um, that's fine as far as I'm concerned. I don't see that being a problem. Uh, I would absolutely reject the predicate of your, of, your, of your criticism, the suggestion that somehow uh, it's a problem if the faculty of Harvard University looks like or sounds like or thinks like, you know, is, is very different than America. Um, why in the world should it be the case that uh, one would think that an elite university should sound like, look like, whatever, America? I'm totally against, if you tell me that there are people who are seeking positions 
and there is discrimination, invidious discrimination against them. They teach something and they are rejected because they are Republican or because of you know, some position they hold. That's a problem. On the other hand, if we have a, you know, a, a department and it turns out that that department is all Republican or all Democratic, that in and of itself doesn't really say very much to me at all in terms of determining you know, how good a department it is. This is a institution that has a educational mission. It's not a legislature. It's not a jury. And the values that should matter are intellectual slash scholarly values, not, you know, how did people vote? I, I, um, and I, I appreciate your frankness on this. I think we're actually making uh, progress. Maybe not good progress, but we're making progress. I, the, I do think there's a problem at Harvard, and I think you just captured it. Uh, yes, uh, this idea that, oh, should Harvard look like the rest of America, perish the thought on that. But the problem is that in a place like this law school, half of the, the judges on federal courts hold views that are decidedly uh, uh, um, opposite from virtually all of your faculty. Uh, this, this country is equally divided uh, between conservatives, moderates, uh, and liberals. It's actually a healthier environment than Harvard. I would take that environment any day. I would take the rest of America that, President, that, that Professor Kennedy refers to as a better intellectual environment than this one because there is a diversity of thought. And no one is suggesting that you should pick people, say we're gonna pick Republicans, but I just pose the question of, does this happen by accident? That you are so far off the charts in terms of ideology, or is it because you are replicating your own views? And I've heard people write that hiring a conservative faculty member is like teaching, hiring someone who's gonna teach geocentrism. It's just wrong. So why would we add them to the law faculty? It's as easy as that. All you have to do is just say that that way, that we're elite. And so the rest of the country be damned and the rest of the country is wrong. A few years ago, Harvard Crimson, which is a wonderful newspaper, has done really good work in this area. I don't agree with them uh, in, in a lot of respects. But a, years ago, a few years ago, they found one of the last remaining Republicans on your, uh, at, at one of your departments. And it was a 90-year-old political scientist named Professor Mansfield. And they went and interviewed him. And they did everything but poke him with sticks uh, to see um, what a Republican looks like and sounds like. And he said something that was sort of interesting. He said, I don't think a conservative has been hired in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in the last decade. Because if you're conservative and want to get on with your colleagues, you have to indulge in self-censorship. And I think a number of students do that as well, but I can't get my colleagues to think that this is a problem. And that's from one of your faculty members, or a number of faculty members that have said that. Now you might not accept it's a problem because it doesn't affect you, it doesn't affect your speech. What you hear is exactly what many of you believe. And you probably don't see the need of hearing the opposing view. That's the rest of America, right? Or maybe it's half the federal courts. But are you fully educated in that environment? I guess we could debate that. What I'm saying is that as a, someone who has spent his life doing public interest litigation, I don't think you're better lawyers for it. I don't think you're better lawyers being educated in an echo chain. And yes, I think your faculty's failed you. And, but it's, nothing's gonna change until donors and students say, maybe we could use greater diversity, even if it makes us look like the rest of the country. As we get close to the end of the debate, amazingly, this has gone by so quickly, and thank you both for somehow knowing exactly what I was going to ask you and making my job incredibly easy. And for the audience, I, I, I'm gonna wrap up a, a few of the questions into one to close us out. 
And I can tell that this is a law group because they're much longer than the questions I normally get at some of our other campus Liberty Tour debates. Um, but a lot of people are curious about this idea of self-censorship from students. Um, and in Professor Turley's direction, they want to know, is this not actually a sign that conservatives perhaps are afraid of having their ideas challenged if they are self-censoring? And to Professor Kennedy, um, why do you think students are self-censoring? And is it an overreaction to their perception of the speech environment at Harvard? Professor Turley, would you like to go first? Well, I'm afraid the question, the premise is sort of blaming the victim in the sense of, uh, well, conservatives must just be uh, afraid of being contradicted. That is an easy rationale that you can take. It's really not us, it's not the environment, it's not the faculty, it's not student body. It's that conservatives are not nearly as bold as liberals are uh, to state what they say. These students are trying to do well. Okay, these students are, are worried that they will, it will be held against them. I hear that from students all the time. Students don't engage in self-censorship as a natural default. It's not in your nature, okay? You're too young for that. Shutting you up is a problem, but it's self-censorship is not one of your natural inclination. So you can certainly rationalize the self-censorship, which all these surveys, not just at FIRE, these are overlapping surveys coming up with almost identical results here at Harvard. You could deny that reality, or you could say that it's, it's their fault, or you can ask why this is an unhealthy environment where students don't feel comfortable speaking in class and in public. And if you ask that question, you've got to be prepared for the answer, which is the problem is you. It's your faculty. It's your administration. And that's, that leads to another question. What are you going to do about it? Um, several years ago, in the aftermath of the George Floyd moment, when there was lots of talk about uh, racism being rampant, at Harvard and other places, and uh, minority students being uh, oppressed and marginalized and shut up. Um, I was very vocal in saying that, at least in my view, uh, those uh, protests, that is to say the idea that they, you know, the minority students were being marginalized, were very exaggerated. I thought that Harvard University and other universities of its sort were generally open. Nobody, you don't have to worry about the gulag. Um, you cannot expect to speak and have everyone agree with you. One of the things that happens when you talk about things that matter to people, there is going to be friction. People are going to disagree. Voices are going to be raised. That's what comes with discussion. I said that then, I'm saying that now. And frankly, um, what I hear from time to time is what I would call you know, conservative snowflakeism. Don't want to hear it. You don't have to worry about the gulag. If you want to speak, speak. Say your piece, I'll say mine, we'll learn from one another, hopefully. Uh, some of what I hear, frankly, I, I view, um, it, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's the conservative, it's the conservative version of microaggressions. It's so micro, it's not there. At Georgetown University, uh, when I attended, there were conservative students who were reported to the administration for allegedly creating an unsafe environment for fellow students through their speech. At what point do you think pushback to conservative speech actually becomes anti-free speech and a problem? Listen, I mean, it, it, certainly, it certainly can be. And at Georgetown, again, I mean, at Georgetown, it seems to me it was, it was quite clear that uh, George, the Georgetown law faculty, well, the administration was taking actions, repressive actions against conservatives, and it was very bad. Again, I, you know, does that happen? Sure. Yes, it does happen. And the episode that you're talking about, very bad, not going to defend that. Um, 
Again, for the purposes of this discussion, I want to come back to Harvard supports free speech and intellectual diversity. I mean, higher education you know, is a big country, big country, but the focus here was about this institution. This, I, I, I'm perfectly happy to speak of in defense, not only in defense, I'll champion this institution. I think this institution actually represents the best, the best in terms of uh, uh, intellectual freedom and intellectual accomplishment. It facilitates the best of what universities should be about. To close this out, I'm going to give you each a minute to respond to uh, what appears to be one of the areas of agreement. Which Should I respond first to him or are we just? Very briefly, please. Um, I think that Harvard actually can ascribe and aspire to something more than the Gulag standard of free speech. No one's suggesting that, you know, people are worried they're going to be sent to a Gulag, okay? But to treat all of the people, all the students and faculty at Harvard that have contributed to these studies, to call them all snowflakes is precisely the problem at Harvard. Yeah, you can say that. Yeah, you can say, well, just speak. We've reduced your numbers, certainly. You view classes as hostile. You view the environment here as hostile. Just speak up, snowflake. Yeah, you could do that. You can show total disregard for these views. And you know what? It's not going to make a big difference, right? You're Harvard. You're going to stay Harvard. But the question is, what are you about? Are you really about saying that all these faculty members and students, a significant portion of your colleagues who are saying they don't feel comfortable speaking, that they're all just snowflakes that should just melt away. If you want to do that, then that's fine. That's the echo chamber you're going to create. But I'm telling you, you won't come out of this with the education you could have had if you had greater diversity of thought here. And the final question, and we'll have Pro Professor Kennedy go first, and you'll close since you got the, the opening remarks. Um, the area of agreement that I heard between you two throughout the debate was that no institution, including Harvard, is perfect. If you had to identify one thing that you think Harvard could do better in regards to free speech and intellectual diversity, what would that thing be? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think that Harvard University should um, actually defend itself much more strenuously uh, in terms of the uh, assault that is being launched against it uh, by the government. If, if, if it was up to me, that, that would be the, the single most important thing that it should do. Uh, and let me just end by saying to people here who are part of this community, when one thinks about, again, you know, we're speaking, you know, the, the issue, Harvard, Harvard Law School. Now, Harvard University is a big place, and there are lots of Harvard University I don't know about. I am at this law school. And if one thinks about the education that one gets at this law school, you mentioned, you mentioned constitutional law. Um, if you are a student at Harvard Law School, and you want to know about public law, and you want to know about conservative thinking in public law, I would urge you, well, you know, there's Adrian Bermule, there's John Manning, there's Jack Goldsmith, there's Steve Sachs, among others, along with a whole list of people on the left. There is no way that a conscientious student here can leave here saying that they did not have access to a very widespread set of uh, teachers who could uh, uh, educate them about the full spectrum of thought with respect to public law and indeed private law as well. So again, I uh, not only defend but champion 
uh, Harvard Law School and Harvard University. I, I think I'd like to, um, in the last minute, just speak to those people at this university who are the dissenters, uh, the people who are part of all those surveys. You know, when I went to University of Chicago, I loved it. I, I, I had never really met a Republican. I grew up in a liberal democratic family. I knew they existed, I just had never really spoken to one. And when I went to Chicago, I lived at a, at a, in a vegetarian cooperative in the basement that Trotskyites would meet. Upstairs we had militant vegans, next door we had libertarians. I thought they were all crazy and I loved every minute of it. I couldn't believe that people could see things that I was seeing and see something completely different. You don't have that range. Yeah, you have some faculty that you can seek out to get access to. But I'm speaking to those people who are dissenters here at Harvard. I don't think Harvard's going to change. The question is whether it will change you. And what I would suggest to you is that George Bernard Shaw once said that unreasonable people expect the world to conform to them. And that's why all history is made by unreasonable people. If you're going to be one of those unreasonable people, welcome to the fight for free speech. It's a tough choice to make. I agree with Professor Kennedy. You have no choice. You've got to speak up. You're one of a very small percentage here at Harvard, but you have to speak up. Not because you're going to change this culture, because you can't allow it to change you. So if you want to become an unreasonable person, welcome to the fight. We certainly need you. Thank you so much to both of our wonderful debaters. And uh, yes, please give them a round of applause. Now, before you run out, we are going to again answer the poll. Do you agree or disagree with the resolution that Harvard supports free speech and intellectual diversity? And we'll see if any minds were changed. <laughs>